Cool. Yep. That's it. Hi everyone and welcome to Lanarkshire Family History Society's webinar for November. My name is Claire Wilson and I will be your host for this evening. My co-host tonight is Christine Woodcock in Canada. Christine, can you believe we're at November already? I cannot believe we're at November already. And you know what? I went to write down 2022 and realized we're nearly a quarter of a way through the century already. No. Like that is mind boggling, eh? I know. I mean, I remember actually sitting down and trying to work out what age is going to be for the millennium. And then you sit now and you think, gosh, that was like 20 odd years ago. <laughs> I was so young. <laughs> no, I know. <laughs> and now that the years are just creeping up. Uh, so um, we are streaming tonight to YouTube, everyone. So if you don't want to be seen, then I would turn your cameras off. Uh, it also does help if you turn your camera off with the bandwidth because um, it is um, getting a bit more popular these days, so it does stop cameras freezing and delays, etc. Uh, pop a note in the chat box, tell us where you're watching from tonight. We'd love to know where everyone's um, coming from and what the weather's like and what you're all up to with your research. Um, I think I mentioned last month that next year, next year 2022 in Scotland has been deemed Year of Stories. It's something that's so relevant in family history. Well, Christine's got a smile on her face. <laughs> we're we're um, so excited about this topic. Um, it is, it's, it's massive. And the Kilted Ancestors group that, that Christine and myself run on Facebook will be providing a range of events um, as we go right throughout the year. We're going to have different topics every month. There's going to be a lot of hype about it. So come and join. I'll pop some details into the chat box and we would love to have you. Uh, we're also looking at having a conference which is going to be called Kilted Culture. Um, very exciting, we're just at the moment confirming speakers and we will keep you updated as the details are launched. Probably be next month before we have details, but keep an eye out on social media for that one as well. Um, Christine, what have you got going on? Uh, well, I'm nothing. I'm just I'm watching where everybody's coming in from, and somebody here has Crawford as a name, and that's my family name. So, that's <laughs> cousin, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? I know. That's I've it. got. Um, I'm very excited about the Kilted Culture and the conferences, and just the monthly um, stuff that we're going to be doing on uh, Kilted Ancestors. I'm very excited about that. Um, I've also got my own virtual conference coming up January 22nd, which um, we'll be talking about four topics. We'll be talking about the um, Jacobites, the Covenanters, the uh, slave, uh, British slave owners, and the witches database. And then later this month, I'm actually going to be doing a webinar on um, emigration from Scotland. So lots coming up to be excited about. Yeah, well, and that's it. I think it's good to have things like that over the winter months. Yeah, well, and especially you know, through this pandemic, right? Because we yeah. all just kind of sat on hold for so long. So, yeah, so it's good to have something to look forward to as well. Mm -hmm. um, so our presenter for tonight is Sean. Um, so I've got my bit of paper to get my details here. Um, Schmals from Titanic Honour and Glory. For 20 years, Sean's company has been providing exhibitions and artifacts relating to the Titanic, World War I and World War II to museums and galleries across the world. They also provide presentations to a number of groups and charitable organisations. How are you this evening, Sean? I'm doing very well, thank you, Claire. It's been a, a wonderful day, especially on this uh, Armistice Day. I've um, been working with Primary 7 children through in Edinburgh and we have had a, a whale of a time with the Primary 7 today doing World War II. It's been fantastic and great to see the, the younger generation really you know, taking such an interest in, in, in the, the legendary stories and the heroes of the, of the World War II. It's really, really good. Oh, that's brilliant, that's brilliant. So Sean's presentation, as you'll see from his background, is the First World War story. And as, as we've said, it's an appropriate topic given that today is the 11th of November. World War I was one of the most catastrophic conflicts in history. 
Tonight, Sean is dressed in full period Allied soldiers uniform, and he's going to take us on a journey back to the years of 1914 to 1918. He will shared with us stories of the times, including the life of both Allied and German soldiers, which will include personal stories of veterans. We will encounter rare historic artefacts from the war and hear about some of the fascinating stories attached to them. Remember that if you do have any questions for Sean, you can pop them into the chat box. I think he has his own um, something planned for the questions, am I right, Sean, <laughs> as we go through it? <laughs> all will be revealed, all will be revealed. Um, so without further ado, I'll, I'll hand over to you, Sean. Thank you very much, Claire, and thank you, Christine. Um, I'll, just, I'll just share my screen just now, and hopefully um, modern technology and everything goes well. And we will then um, proceed with this evening's presentation. So I hope that everyone can see the screen in front of us just now. That's fine, yeah. That's fantastic. And we will go on with what the agenda is this evening. So. To, Tonight's presentation, the topic outline will be the prelude to war, the outbreak of war, recruitment, uniforms and equipment, workers in the war effort, Verdun, sorry, trench warfare, Verdun, February 1916. And we'll also look at this, the Somme, July 1916. We'll also look at the war as hell, sacrifices in war. And we're going to go through wartime, U-boats, America joins the war, new technology, the Zeppelin, the airplane, flying aces, animal heroes, the armistice, lest we forget artifacts and there'll be an activity of a, of a World War I quiz to test everybody's knowledge of, of what they've been learning this evening. And there'll also be a, a presentation uh, for the group as well for attending this evening, a virtual presentation. So I hope that you will all enjoy this evening and to sit back and relax as we take a, a journey back into the years of 1914, 1918. So we're going to look at what actually happened. Now we look at the, the prelude to war. We have Gavrilo Princip, who is, uh, is, is the main assassin here. And he is actually looking to, to assassinate Archduke Franz Ferdinand and, and his wife. Now they were the heir to the throne of the Austrian-Hungarian Empire. And at this point in time, they, it, it was almost in a way they were trying to avoid a conflict. And it was a way to bring um, the countries into war. Now he had a motorcade, and the motorcade, as we can see in the picture, was open. Uh, he had various uh, bodyguards around them as they were going through uh, Sarajevo at the time. And there was one failed assassination attempt, which involved a, a, a grenade being thrown into the actual the car, as we can see, which missed the Archduke. But as the car came round for a second time, Gavrilo pounced forward and at point blank range, he assassinated and mortally killed Archduke Franz Ferdinand and his wife. Now, it was a terrible time that actually happened when you think um, that, you know, this was unbelievable, the unthinkable thing that happened. The witnesses that witnessed this also, and here's this young gentleman who was a member of the Black, Black Hand Gang. There was very much, you could say, of a, a terrorist organisation at that time. And he was really ruthless in what he did with his with his pistol. And we can see here it's the FM M 1910 38 caliber pistol that was used. And this is the actual gun that we see here that was actually used by Gavrilo Princip that happened that day. And this was really the vital spark. This is what really threw Europe into chaos and really got the First World War to, to begin. This was really the start of the foundations of this conflict. And it was a terrible situation for, for the people that witnessed this. The, the heir to the throne was now sadly passed away. Now what was going to happen was the, the conflict that would go on for four long years. And when we look at the, the German advance through Belgium and the atrocities that actually happened, we've got the Kaiser's army, as it was known. And the Kaiser's army, 50,000 troops marching through Belgium, they were terrorising the, the civilians, they were burning houses, burning villages. They were really, it was ransacking the whole place. They were running riot, basically, the Kaiser's army. And at this point, their main aim was to get through to Paris, to capture Paris, the City of Light. And we can imagine the sheer terror 
of this, and it was basically an annihilation, really, you could put it, of the steamroller of the Kaiser's army going through Europe at this time. It was almost unstoppable. It was then that the British Expeditionary Force was then across. They were bolstering with the French army to get ready to stop this invading army, this invading force coming through into France. And it was a, such a terrible time for everyone involved, this huge conflict, that it really did shock the whole part of Europe to the core. And we can imagine what that must have been like, as we see these soldiers dressed here with their pickle pop helmets. We can see the, the private here, as we can see, as he would have been at that time. And even in America, you can imagine the propaganda, which we'll talk about later, the posters that were used to, to really engage people, to get them behind the war effort, to get people really in this, this core to fight against this horrible regime at the time. Remember Belgium, buy bonds for liberty bonds and loans, trying to get people in this conflict. So we're going to move forward on to the next slide. And I hope everyone can see the screen. If anybody has any problems, please let me know and I'll be happy to, to, um, to go back or go forward, for example. So recruitment was a very, very important part of the First World War. Lord Kitchener, as we can see on the screen here, very, very important um, man whose face would appear in many of the main recruiting posters of the time. Your country needs you. Now, this was really aimed at trying to get as many of the young soldiers and youngsters into to the recruitment process as much as possible because we really needed a lot of soldiers. I'm going to look at what the life of a soldier was like at that time. Now, can you imagine that at that time we are living, many young lads are living in working class environments where we're working in the foundries, working in farmyards or in factories, for example. So the thought of getting the king shilling was such a, a a really ideal opportunity. For these young lads, they were thinking actually, not of the horrors of the war which were about to come, but they were thinking about, wow, we're gonna get an opportunity to go abroad. For many, they would never have been able to have that opportunity and to wear the uniform of the king as well was gonna be something to be very proud of. So this was in the minds of these young lads that were going off to war. So when they would go through the recruitment process, like many, as we do throughout the war. They would go through a very strict and regime medical to make sure that they are fit and well enough to go to war. It was only then that they would, re they would receive their uniforms, they would attend their barracks or their billets, they would then engage with their other fellow comrades and arms, other fellow soldiers, and they would grow up very quickly. They would go in as young boys, as one veteran would say, and they would come out as men. And here they would learn the main aspects of combat, basic training, as we can see on the screen. You had to be physically fit. You also had to be very well uh, physical and mentally as well was another part of their, their, uh, their training to make sure that they could go through the horrors that would, would come to them as we will go further on to the story. And you would know that we'd also have machine gun crews, as we can see on the screen just now as well. And incredible that these men would all work together. You'd have your artillery groups, and then you would also have your Royal Flying Corps. But the RAF at that point was, was not existent. The RAF was until later we had the Royal Flying Corps. So it was such an, an incredible opportunity for these young men. And as we say, they did not think for one minute of the horrors that was going on. And they were proud. They were good, saying goodbye to their loved ones, to their family members, thinking that, you know, they would this big adventure, they would be back soon. And who would have known the terrible things that these poor boys would go through? I mean, we say boys because a lot of these young lads were really, you know, they were not long out of school. Many would actually lie about their age to, to join the war effort because friends would join, so they would want to be there with their friends rather than being left back home. So the recruitment process was very, very important. It had to enable these young men to, to really recruit them into being strong, willed and real strong soldiers. And they would do, as we can see on the screen, you know, their bayonet training, their rifle training, down to the Lee Enfield rifle, which was the main rifle of the, the soldier serving on the front lines in the First World War. And again, in the trenches, getting an idea of what this combat would have been like, they're uh, crawling along. Imagine the barbed wire fences with the, 
you know, the, the, the loud bangs, the explosions. In training, this would have been a totally different scenario to the actual real events that these lads would have went through, even in the psalm, for example. So when we look at the uniforms and the equipment, the Kaiser's army that we can see to the right-hand side of the page here was almost unchanged in a way. It was the, the field blues, the, um, it was the grey, the bluish grey colour that they had, very much of a woolen type material. And the problem with this uniform as well was once it was wet, it became very heavy and it would be very much sodden through with wet, you know, very, very cold and very damp. So it was difficult. You had to make sure you had to keep your, your body clean and, and warm because of any of the or possible a disease that you could have, which we will encounter through, for example, trench foot. You would also see they've got equipment very much similar to what they would use later on in World War II. They've got their, their pistol here, their belts, leather belts. The Germans had incredible uniforms, very well adapted. They had their, their rifles that we can see here, their Mauser rifles, bolt action rifle. We also had their putties. The putties were designed to go over the boots and halfway up towards the, just under the knee, the design of the putty was again, was to stop water getting into the boots and also protecting the leg area, the ankles, for example, the lower leg from barbed wire. So it was to design to so not to be snagging on that or to cause any damage or to the, to the soldier himself. And these uniforms really weren't designed that well for the First World War I battlefield. As I say, this was, you can imagine, it was almost like a trial you know, we weren't in, in a war like this before, so we were being thrown into the situation. So we were really, it was a test to see how things were going to adapt, what we could improve on for, for throughout the war. I mean, we look at the, the German helmet, for example. It was based on like almost a gladiator helmet. And you can imagine it protects the back of the neck down to the back area here. And its scalloped front, again, was very protective around the head area, around the, the the, the eye area especially, you also had two adaptions at the front which could be closed for a, a, a shield to come down, for example, if you were a sniper on the, the battlefield to give you protection in the head area as well and also the, the face area there. Again, very similar to what they've worn in the Second World War, the uniform didn't change that much, so just slight adaptions. And then when we look at the, the uniform of the British Tommy, when we can see very similar, we've got the puttees, we've got their Tommy boots there, the lay and field rifle, their equipment, and their webbing, for example. The British uh, Expeditionary Force uniform, very much buttoned up very much to the, to the throat area here, very, very tight around the neck area. For some soldiers, it caused a lot of uh, rashes around the neck area, especially when it was wet. And if you were lucky, you could have that actually with a silk lining in there or for example, the same material as your combat weapon, just to take away that horrible, itchy um, feeling, especially for the soldiers being wet. And the uniform itself was very like the German one, very, very heavy when there was torrential rain. We can see we have a soldier there who has his actual covers on for his rain covers for, for the combat experience. You can imagine there he's got his boots on as well, just trying his best to keep himself dry. The Tommy helmet, as again, was not, as good as the German helmet. The Tommy helmet, or the Brody helmet as it was designed, only like a turtle helmet, was very much just along the top of the ear area here. And again, it did not offer much protection around the neck area at the back. And for king and country, you had to look even absolutely great in uniform, even on the battlefield. That was another thing that you had to look good when you were in the forces in World War I. Presentation was everything, and even off, off the battlefield and on the battlefield was very, very important. And again, one of the biggest problems that happened in the First World War was obviously the mud, the heavy rainfall, as we can see in the picture here. You just can't imagine how much these soldiers must have suffered with the, the trench foot, you know, with that terrible, terrible situation with their feet. And as one soldier would say, one veteran would say, that the worst thing that happened was your feet your feet, you could get hypothermia because once your feet are wet, it's impossible to keep them dry. 
you have to get out of these boots, you have to get out of the socks, you have to change that as very quickly as you possibly can. And the problem with that was that in the midst of battle, the sadly the supplies were quite slow in coming in to the, to the front lines. So soldiers really had to put up with trying to dry the socks, the boots, etc., as, as best they could in their own way. And that's what led to a lot of the difficulties at that time. And then trench foot and you had the, it was, it was terrible. Um, soldiers that could hardly walk with it, they were in a difficult situation and there was not really any way that you could get the help. You had to stand your ground and you had to fight. That was what was expected to you. You had to, in a way, it's horrible to say, but the words, as one veteran said, you had to really stand up and be counted and you couldn't complain. In the other words, is what they would say, you had to man up and just get on with the job rather than uh, not, you know, sit and complain or try and get things sorted. Now the time that we talk about the soldiers, we're going to look at the workers and the war effort. So what happened when the, the, the men were away to the front lines where they are fighting? We now have a situation where we have the ladies who would then come in and the ladies who would then take over the role in the foundries and the factories, for example, the munition factories, as we can see on the screen, on how their lives depend. So women in the war effort were very, very important indeed, and such a great privilege to recognise women today and, and what they did in the First World War, because with making you know, the ammunition, making the artillery shells, we would have been in a different situation. We would have had no way to, to, to fight the, the, the Kaiser's army. We would have been in a very, very difficult situation. You can imagine what these girls must have went through, stepping up and going into the gentlemen's jobs and the men's jobs where they actually were, were not used to doing this type of hard manual labor. And almost they would go yellow as well because of the gunpowder, the ammunition, um, as, we, as was known in the Second World War as well, the canaries, canary girls, because of the colour that they would go, they would go that bright yellow, a luminous yellow colour. So it must have been quite bad for them to work in that environment. And yes, a lot of them did suffer greatly in later life because of this uh, environment that we're working in. We didn't have what we have nowadays with ventilation. We didn't have the health and safety as it is known throughout the world nowadays. So it was really incredible work and hard, hard manual labour for some of these girls working there as well. So we have a lot to, to thank uh, for, the, for the women and the war effort especially. There was even one story many years ago that I spoke to a, a lovely lady in a care home who, who told me a story that when she had worked in the munition factories, and this was one actually not far away from where I live, um, it's a place called a foundry well known called Karen Ironworks and it's in Falkirk. And they were very well known for producing ammunition. And she said that we were working long, long hours and the noise was deafening. She said we had girls that were so thin and so small that were, you know, were pulling chains and working machinery that you were wondering how on earth they managed to, to actually to work and manage to use their equipment. But with sheer determination because they knew that their husbands their loved ones were on the front line so they really wanted to do their part and she says and that's what we did we we didn't complain we got on with the job we worked many long hours we worked early mornings and it was uh, our duty we looked at it as our duty for for the country to that we were doing our part and she was a wonderful lady and she told me that you know it was incredible when she used to put her hands inside the shell to make sure that the shell casings were nice and clean there were they were okay for the ammunition, etc. And then we go through another part of the production. And she says, yes, there was a lot of injuries. She says, but you know, she says, that was a time where we, we just got on with it. We, we did our best. And as long as we could still function and as long as we could still do our part, we would do that. And it was great to see women like this lovely lady being, being actually recognised and, and, and remembered as their part in the war effort. And you can clearly see, for example, We've got an, a great illustration there of the ladies with all the shells, the ammunition cases, and even on the machinery, as we can see here, actually tooling out an ammunition shell. And it's not an easy job to do that. It has to be precision. It has to be very, very good engineering to do this, or it's going to affect the outcome of a battle on the battlefield if the shells are not functioning properly as, as they should. So it's all credit to the, to the ladies and the girls in the war effort. So then we're going to look at now is the uh, the trench warfare. And we touched on about the, the trench route, for example. So soldiers going into the front line. 
And it became a stalemate in the Western Front where trenches were now, it was a, it was a stalemate where we had to dig in and both sides, German and the, the Allies say the, the Axis Power, sorry, were digging in and to make sure that there was a stalemate. And that this stalemate went on for many years, as we know, in the First World War. But many people say, did the soldiers actually dig the trenches themselves? Well, the truth is, yes, they actually did. And we can see there, we've got a real illustration of actually a machine that actually was used to dig out trenches. But there were situations where they were manually dug out as well. And then you would have your duck boards, your, your support boards, and for many of the veterans, uh, sadly, who long passed away, there was one in particular who lived well over 100, would say that, you know, we had a difficult situation in a trench. If a wall gave way, it was horrible to think that the soldiers could be not only crushed, but they would be buried in amongst all the debris as the walls would fall in on them. And this actually happened quite a lot. So the trenches had to be built in a really good way. And it had to be done efficiently so that they would last through any bombardment from the enemy and also the weather conditions. Because as he said, if you had really terrible torrential weather, rain, or through the winter months, this would soften the actual ground area. So again, would weaken the structure and then could collapse the trench in and all the soldiers inside the trench themselves. So to, to life in a trench was not an easy one. You can see in the, the um, illustration there that we've got uh, at the top, you can see the communication trench, we've got the forward um, listening post, you've got no man's land, you've got the front line trench, the fire bar, we've got the support trench, the company HQ, it was all linking up together. So every part of the trench system had to know what the next one was doing and so on. We had to function as a great team together. There was no point in the company HQ dugout telling us all to do one thing. And then, for example, the communication trench didn't know what that was to say and, and so on to the front line trench. So we all had to work in unison to make sure that we all knew what we were doing. And it was a terrible situation as well, because on your front line trench, you were always at the risk of the continual bombardment or, for example, the, the sharpshooters coming across no man's land from the, the German area, the German trenches where they would fire and many soldiers were actually killed sadly, as we can imagine the soldier here in this picture who's very cautiously heading up towards the front line just to check what's on the other side, making sure there's no one coming forward because you would always have a stray soldier walking across the front line trying to get information and trying to actually get an idea how we can get into this trench to, to take over the trench. And for many trench attacks themselves, it was very, very nerve-wracking because you get to imagine that you are living in this, it's an, 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 earth, an earthly experience to live in a trench, as one veteran says, because you've got rats running along there, there's hardly any sanitation, the sanitation is very difficult, you've got your trench foot, and then when you hear that whistle going and you have to get the orders to go over the top, you do not know if you're going to survive that contact or you're going to come back or you're going to be living the next day. It was a day where you did not know whether you were going to survive and the next day and the day after that and so on. And you became such a close-knit family. But one veteran in particular, particular I remember in a care home who had said many years ago that he had a good friend who he, he was very close with and he said it was terrible that he went through post-traumatic stress because of the shelling, the constant shelling. And as we know, that was known as shell shock. And he said at the time, he says, it was not recognised as it is nowadays. We had, you know, people were, were sadly, people were shot because they were classed as deserters. They, they were classed as cowards. But in actual fact, what was going through them was post-traumatic stress disorder. They were having a terrible experience. As one soldier said, it was a living hell, a living nightmare to be in a trench system. And he said that when you got that order to go over the top and you were one of the lucky ones that would come back, he says it was, uh, it was a godsend and you never knew if you would. And it was sad to leave men actually in the front lines and no man's land because there's nothing we could do. We couldn't go back for them. We, we went back, we would then be shot, we'd be killed ourselves. And another thing that happened in the, the trenches as well, that soldiers, believe it or not, actually would have drowned in the mud. I don't know if anybody knows about that. The mud was so dense that when you're weighted down with all your equipment and your heavy boots and you're going through that mud, 
it was almost like a quagmire. It was like quicksand. You were sinking. So you were going down. If you went in, you could not get back up again. And it was difficult to get soldiers out with all this hell of gunfire going on, explosions, etc. So it was a, a horrifying experience for these poor souls. And as we can see there as well, we've got soldiers that are all ready to go over the top. They've got their Lewis guns at the ready. And the Lewis gun, as we know, was the, was the gun which was the the ammunition circular belt feed, which again was a, a very powerful machine gun at the time. And this was used as well as the, the Lee Enfield rifle. So Company HQ, as you can see, was right at the back. You'd have a reserve trench that would come from at the back of that one. And again, your commanding officers would be in here giving out the orders and each trench would link up to others as well. And there's many stories as well where the Germans, uh, especially the, the British as well, would would tunnel underneath to try and blow other trench trench systems up in a way to, to try and help defeat the enemy, as if it were. And again, this went on. And again, as many soldiers that were doing this would sadly lose their lives because of the, the conditions that they were in at the time. But we'll look more about the, the battles that were involved in the trenches as we go on. So the first battle we're going to look at was a, a German offensive. This is Verdun, this is February 1916. And you just got to imagine, as we can see, each side suffered 500,000 casualties. Now that is an incredible amount of uh, soldiers to sadly lose their life in an incredible battle. And it was a, a terrible battle that actually was inflicted with the French as well. And as you can see, it was like a fortified area here that we were trying to, to capture. And this was actually one of the first reconnaissance pictures that was actually taken of the battlefield. And what really alarmed myself as well was all the shell holes that you can see there. It actually, the, the whole battlefield is littered with shell holes. So you can imagine the intensity of battle at this Battle of Verdun. It was an incredible, it was an annihilation really, where, where the French soldiers especially suffered great, Tra tragedies and, and incredible casualties. Many soldiers would be going over the top and many soldiers sadly would not come back. There's many soldiers who actually would, would struggle to get back because of the, the, the difficulties of their wounds and the catastrophic uh, casualty rate that was going on in this battle. The Germans were, were, were absolutely incredible uh, on, the, on the offensive as well. They just kept on coming and coming, there was no way of stopping them. And it became such a stalemate at one point where there was ammunition which was, was actually low. And then you would have the horrifying thoughts of the war where it would turn to hand-to-hand -to -hand combat. And that hand-to-hand -hand combat, without being too, too horrifying about it, but it's to, just to bring that history to life, you're talking about soldiers fighting with their bare hands. You're talking about soldiers fighting with their helmets with their shovels that they've got for entrenching tools. Anything at all that they could use as a weapon at all was used on that hand-to-hand -hand combat. And it was absolutely catastrophic in many occasions. Soldiers would be lying all over the battlefields at the end, and there was no way to sadly have them brought back. And many to this day are still in the battlefields in France where they actually sadly lay as casualties at that time, all those years ago. Very, very tra tragic indeed. But one of the biggest battles that was one of the worst in British military history was the actual Battle of the Somme in July 1916. It all started with an incredible artillery attack. And the British actually believed that they could fire onto the German trench systems and knock out the German lines and disable the German positions, disable the German artillery positions and their strong guns that they had. This was what was on the, on, the, on the minds of all the high, high command of the British Army at the time. And they sent in thousands of soldiers um, over the top. And you know that the soldiers were marching across no man's land because once the artillery shells stopped, every soldier believed, they really believed that there was no need, there was nothing to worry about. The Germans were knocked out, it's just going to be across, walking across no man's land. We will then enter the, the, the German trenches into that territory, and we will then take this over. There'll be no casualties. Well, they were absolutely wrong. Very, very tragic, very sad. Over 60,000 British soldiers, as we know, were killed in one day alone. 
and it was absolutely catastrophic. It actually shook the, the military to its foundation. They could not believe that this was happening. One of the worst uh, tragedies in British military, as we say, in that history. So the soldiers that are walking across no man's land, as we can imagine, just like this picture here, they're young lads, they're new recruits, they've just arrived on the front lines, they've not got, not got a lot of experience in the fight, so they're thinking to themselves, as we said, this adventure, you know, we're going to get to the other side, we're going to be heroes, no one's going to have to lose their life, but how sad, sad could they be? And many soldiers that day can remember the whizzing and the buzz of the bullets that would fire, and they were in shock. And they would drop, so they would lie on their fronts trying to take cover. And many would actually lie in shell holes that had been made in the battlefields previous because of the shelling, just to get that cover. And sadly, many would lose their life there as well. Many would not be able to get back. And for the wounded, there'd be cries and shouts and even cries for their mothers. That was another horrifying experience in the Battle of the Somme. You'd hear the soldiers crying well into the night where it was dark. And again, we could not even get out there to rescue them because the Germans had their flares that they would send up and it would cascade over the battlefield in a huge light, like a floodlight, which meant that that would illuminate the whole battlefield. So anybody then advancing, or a stretcher bearer, or, or you know, first aiders, the nurses, etc., would then be sadly catastrophically killed as well. There was no um, room at all for any compassion there. It was horrible at that time. And the silence would then quieten down. Then again, artillery shells would then fire, open fire again, hoping that the next wave of artillery would do the job that the first wave and the previous waves before would do. But sadly, this would not to be. And you get an idea, just to look at the size of these artillery, artillery that are firing there, you can get the idea why they really believed that these shells would knock out the German positions. But as we know, it was a, a, a sad, sad situation which never actually happened. And all those poor souls, the heroes lost their life that day. I mean, look at the catastrophic, that over one million were killed in five months. That, and maybe talk to children about that in primary school, and the children, even they, they are absolutely, they find it incredible to think they say that's incredible for, for five months that over one million soldiers were killed. It, it, it's incomprehensible that this would happen. But then it was called off because of the disaster, because of all those soldiers that were being killed. It was a constant wave replacement, another wave, another replacement, and another wave. It was like continual. So that they they, they had to stop. Uh, and the bloodshed had to had to eventually stop in this battle. And it was, as I say, was one of the worst battles in military history for the casualty rates. But as we can see on the screen, we've got war is hell. And yes, it's a horrible word to use, but war is hell. Veterans never got over the catastrophic uh, injuries that they would receive from the gas attacks. As one veteran would say that the gas attacks was one of the worst experiences that they would ever experience in the war. And he said to me, and it was one thing that I always remember, and I thought it's always stuck with me, actually. He said, if you didn't have your gas mask, there was one way that you would survive a gas attack. And I said, what was that? He said, well, he said, you would urinate into a, a handkerchief or a material, and you would cover your face, your nose, your mouth with this. He said, because obviously the, the chemical in the urine would break down the gas, which again would help you survive another day. But without going into too much horrific detail, that if the gas did affect your, affected your lungs, your breathing, so it was a terrible situation where soldiers would actually, they would start to bleed internally in their, their breathing. So in a way, it was a, a very, very horrific way to, to sadly pass away in the battlefield. And once this happened, there was no way that you could be saved because the lungs were very much damaged uh, it, was, it was something that could not be repaired, and, and the bleeding was just uh, incredible. Uh, soldiers' eyes, again, would bleed, their noses, their mouth, etc. It was, it was a horrible warfare that was inflicted on all those soldiers during the First World War. And for soldiers, they would carry their gas mask bags over the front of the uniform, so it was easy to open up and get that gas mask over the face as quick as possible, and your respirator to make sure that you were well protected. A gas attack at times would happen so quickly 
and the warning was very, very little warning at all. And when it, when it did come, you knew you had to do something very quickly and you had to react. As one soldier would say, without being horrible, Senate, he says you had to think about yourself paramount, for, foremost, then you would worry about the man next to you because if you, you're not longer here, you're no use to anybody, that's what he used to say, you have to think about yourself very much so up front. And the casualty rate as well, soldiers that would lose, um, you were talking about losing limbs, um, arms, legs because of the shelling, the wounds that were absolutely horrific that many um, of the field hospitals could not cope with, especially with the Battle of the Somme that we just mentioned for, for, for mentioned just now, that the battle there was incredible, that that was a constant stream into the field hospitals. And then the hospital ships that were going back and forward, taking soldiers back to land, uh, back to Britain as well, to hospital, to convalescent homes where they could recuperate and recover from the horrible situation. And we can imagine with a stretcher bearer here, the, the horrors that these poor souls would have seen. And we can we really relay that to the frontliners nowadays who are the, the, the NHS workers, the nursing staff, the doctors, all around the world that's helped us with the COVID pandemic. We can really relate similar situation to the First World War soldiers who we have the, the medical staff, the, the, the nurses, the, the volunteer aid detachment Corps, for example, that are helping and um, they are doing so much to help the wounded soldiers, the, the field hospitals. Without all those incredible human beings, individuals, soldiers would all ultimately have lost their lives and would never have had that chance of, of survival in the convalescent homes or hospitals, for example. And it affected you mentally as well, not just physically, but the mental scarring was, was an incredible effect for, for people, the soldiers in the First World War, and for their lives being people, civilians after the war. They were dealing with the horrific nightmares of the shells, the explosions, losing their friends who, met, for many, they have come through basic training and the recruitment process with, because when you're in the war, that's your new family. You're, you're away from your family, your friends, so you have a bond with your fellow soldiers, your, your brothers in arms, as we'd say. So that, again, formed that bond. And it's very sad when you see the two soldiers here, they're, you know, the real strength of a soldier, they always have this distinction that they're tough, they're strong, and they are, they do a lot for their, for their country and the fight and the sacrifice of life, but yet they are human beings as well who have feelings. And mentally, sadly, at that time in World War I, it wasn't recognised as it's as nowadays, sadly. So they had to go through this terrible situation or, you know, almost on, on, on a daily basis on their own, many waking up with shaking, with sweating, with, with the horrible nightmares of what they had come through. Incredible um, um, soldiers who had done so much for their country. And the sacrifices in war, I, I think that this is a very poignant picture that we have here of the, of the Tommy walking off into the, the poppy field, Flanders field, and we see the sun, it's almost a heavenly iconic image here. And it's, it's to think about this soldier who sacrificed so much life, uh, their lives for our freedom, for the world that we live today, for, for what we can do. And it's incredible to think that all those young boys, some of them boys as well, just left school and lied about their age so that they could go off to war, that they would have sacrificed their life and for what they had ahead of themselves, a future, so that we could have our, our today and, and our tomorrows as well. And again, we look at the, the Canadian um, soldier here, which is sad when you see the grave there of a Canadian soldier who was killed in action in the World War I battlefield as well. And again, the, um, it, it really does bring that, uh, it's a very poignant image and a very striking image of a tribute to the fallen. And again, even throughout the cemeteries throughout the world, we know that we have our war graves, which is are, are again there. They're, all, they're looked after by the Commonwealth Graves Commission here in the United Kingdom. And it's such a, a privilege when you go to a, a cemetery and you can see the names and you see the, the ages especially. I think personally that's what really, um, it, it really gets uh, emotional with myself. And I look at the ages of some of the young lads that went to war and you think about the life that was lost and you wonder what would have happened to that individual 
hadn't it been for a war, what would he have went on to do in his life? What about a family, a wife that he would have, grandchildren, being a grandfather? It's a very, very tragic. But it's on a day like today, especially on Armistice Day, that we, we reflect on the sacrifices that were made and the sacrifices in war, and very important, especially with the younger generation, which is uh, very proud to be working with schools, that they never, ever forget the sacrifices that were made by the greatest generation of our time, those who fought in the wars, in the First and Second War especially. Now we're going to look at wartime propaganda. Now this is actually going to be talking about what actually gave the, the, the young soldiers of the day the real fight to get into the war and to really become part of this and this, this horrifying experience, really, in a way. I mean, look at this one uh, on the left-hand side of the picture here, which <laughs> it's quite incredible when we try to think about the US brought this out um, for their propaganda to get you know people into the war effort. Destroy this mad brute. It's actually basically giving you the image of a German uh, with his pickle hob helmet on there, like actually lifting this young American lady in his arms and he's marching off there with his club and it's basically saying enlist in the US Army now, giving you that real, you know, let's go and fight this war to try and stop this happening in real life because this really, this is what, what we're trying to get into people's minds and it still happens to this day. We believe things that are told to us. Um, we see things on TV, we read in the newspapers, sometimes the stories can be wrong, but we get the sense that we need to do our part and sometimes we're given that wrong information. And again, this propaganda can be a, a terrible thing and it gives people the wrong story as well. And beat back the Hun with Liberty Bonds. And again, it's focused on the German soldier who is in the trench, looking over there with his hands, trying to get a grip on all of the of the world in a way and trying to say that, you know, they're going to be the dominant uh, force to be reckoned with in this war. So again, this was again to try and get the US into the war because the US wasn't in the war at this point. So everybody was doing their best to try to get the Americans to help to come in. And we'll talk about what brought the Americans into the war in a moment. And this is one what I thought was quite, and the children, especially in primary school, was quite alarmed by this one. They wonder why there's a, a snake there with wearing the Glen Gary, the famous uh, Scottish uh, um, um, Marie, Marie, you know, uniform cap, and we have the, the child there. And again, this is basically trying to say, you know, to protect, protect your child from the, the horrible uh, venomous snake here. And again, this is to show the German side of propaganda, to show, to try and get as many German soldiers into the Kaiser's army as possible to fight in this, this war, to stop this happening to your child. And again, this, this was a horrible way of, of, of propaganda to try to engage people into that conflict to, and really get them into that focus of mind that we had to stop the enemy. And that's what they ultimately everybody was looking at. And it's, it's horrible to look at these pictures and it gives you that real sense and idea of the times. So the Germans had incredible technology during the First World War, including the U-boats. And as we can see here, we've got a U-31 class German U-boat. And we can see we've got the sleeping quarters, 35 men could sleep in very cramped conditions. And yes, it was a very, very difficult situation where you would be under the water for some great deal of time, sinking enemy ships. And they were quite a threat on the coastal waters. They were, they were sinking many ships that were going back and forth, including many of the passenger ships, which we'll talk about in a moment. So life on board a U-boat was, was difficult. And again, you had to be very careful when you're on a U-boat because any noise at all can echo through the, the water. So if you're being hunted, for example, by any other uh, naval ships, you can be depth charged, you can be exploded. You, you, it's, it's very important to be remain quiet and silent under the water because the noise can travel very greatly. And we can see how the ship was powered as well. Battery engines generated explosive hydrogen gas. So again, that was a very, very horrible th situation if you were in one of these ships and this was to take an impact. You can imagine that the the U-boat would just disintegrate into many. It would just explode because of all this explosion on top. They have got torpedoes. We have uh, six torpedoes that are armed, ready to actually 
to, to fight against the enemy as well. And we also have a U31 class uh, year 1914. You can see the tons, 878 tons, and a range which can travel 8,790 miles and can also have the 35 uh, men on, on the ship as well. And as you can see, compare that with the new 2010, this obviously is outdated now, but the British Astute class uh, submarine. You can see the difference in size and how we have came from that technology of the First World War with the U-boats. So again, the Germans brought this into the war and we have established that now as part of the armed forces now because we have obviously the naval, the submariners, etc. So we're going to look at what actually brought America into the war. And it really was a traumatic event. Captain Turner was the captain of the RMS Lusitania. It was a passenger ship. And this passenger ship was operated by the Canard Line. And the Canard Line was uh, obviously they were on a, they, they were not involved in this war. Uh, there was many Americans on the ship, and here we have a German U-boat which actually slightly comes into into Ireland off the old head of Kinsale and fires our torpedoes and strikes the uh, Lusitania on our starboard side. And as we can see in this incredible picture, the Lusitania starts to list dramatically on our starboard side. And Captain Turner, who's in charge of the ship, he orders an immediate evacuation. But so much so, there's explosions felt throughout the ship as the ship is starting to erupt with fire. There's not time to actually get the Lusitania's lifeboats launched. And with this effect, the Americans are now thrust into this conflict and now are going to be supporting the, the, the powers to, to defeat the, um, the Axis forces here. And it's incredible to think that the Lusitania, the, the Germans believe, believe it or not, that she was carrying munitions secretly to Britain. In actual fact, it was coal dust. And coal dust was a very explosive gas. And because she took that torpedo, that's what the explosions were. There was no um, any... Um, she was a peacekeeping ship. She wasn't involved in the war. She was just basically carrying passengers and there was no um, contraband or any ammunition on board at all. And the Lusitania's wreck has been explored over many years and many of the explorers, including that of Dr. Robert Ballard, who is actually an oceanographer, he even said the same thing, that there has been no uh, explosive shells found on the actual uh, Lusitania, which is quite interesting. So again, this could have been another propaganda element to bring the Americans into the war by the Germans. And the Germans actually had this, um, they, they commissioned a, a medal, like almost like a, a controversial victory medal for the sinking of the Lusitania, which again was given to, to many of the crew and they're, they're sold even in auction today. And they're very rare to, to pick up actually. If you find one on the internet, you can find them on, on eBay. And there was a propaganda medal as if it were to, to boast the sinking of this passenger ship. So we'll look at the other technology that's coming out throughout the battlefield. We can see here the, the British uh, tank that was brought out during the, the First World War. Again, they were called ironclad giants. And you can imagine what the German soldiers must have felt when they've seen these tanks actually coming through the battlefield. It must have been quite a, a spectacle for them. No wonder they actually panicked. And then they decided that we would have to do the same. So then they came up with another design, which you can see at the bottom here. This is a replica one um, that's actually in a museum down in England of a German World War tank. They did not offer a great deal of protection. Yes, protection from maybe machine gun fire or uh, rifle fire, for example, but not really anything from artillery attacks or, or even other shells from other tanks they would explode quite easily and sadly a lot of the soldiers would be would be killed in these tanks as well and you have you can see the the cutaway that we've got here of the interior of the tank itself we've got the, the rotating turret which again was was put on these tanks to to help them go through the battlefield and the tracks could actually go cut through the barbed wire uh, barriers they, they they were on the battlefield themselves so again the the french uh, brought out the renault tank as well and um, very, very important tank in the battlefield also. And the Germans uh, just could not match the, the, the Allied side here on that technology. They tried their best, but as you can see, they just did not get it as right. And their tanks actually, believe it or not, 
malfunctioned quite a lot on the battlefield themselves. It was difficult to change tracks, for example, because you can imagine with all this armor that the German tank has got, you imagine trying to change the track, for example, the track has been blown up uh, by a shell, you've got to try and put all that linkage back into place. And again, that'll take a bit of time to do that. You've got to take covers off, et cetera. And again, your tank could be out of commission for, for many days, even up to weeks at a time to get them back on, onto the actual battlefield themselves. You'd have your, your uh, periscope windows here, as I would say, you would open them up the hatches to, to see out. And again, what was dangerous about this was, again, you could be open to an attack by an enemy sharpshooter. And the Germans had incredible sharpshooters in the trench systems as well that could actually fire without any warning. So it was a very difficult situation to take your, your life in your hands, basically, to be in a tank and to look out at this, uh, this viewing window here. Now, the other technology we're going to look at, we spoke about briefly, was the, the gas mask. And the gas mask, as we can see here, you can see that this was a, a, a new technology, a new design that was brought out to protect from the, the gas attacks during the First World War. And what was incredible about this, you had basically had to very quickly get that gas mask on as quick as possible over your head and make sure that it was tight across the back of the neck, right around the front area to your respirator and that you were well and truly covered from anything to save your lungs because obviously the gas affected the resp respiratory system in the body. And once this was affected, there was absolutely no way in that, that you could be saved, sadly. The Germans also brought out the, um, the flamethrower that you can see here. And this was quite a, a, a terrible weapon as well, a, a vengeance weapon in a way in the First World War. It was used to, to flush out enemy trenches and it was used by a burning oil. Now, not being too horrible about it in a way when we talk about the burning oil, but that oil was highly flammable and that jet of flame and oil could cause sustainable damage in any trench system and the casualty rates were absolutely incredible. And sadly, a lot of the casualties through the um, attacks by the flamethrowers would, would lose their lives because of the, the, the horrible injuries that they would inflict. We'd also have... The, um, the new system here, which again, you can see the British Tommies here with, uh, it's almost like the modern day radar in a way. And it, what was was big speakers that could pick up any um, artillery noises or, for example, enemy aircraft coming overhead. So this again was a new technology that was brought out to, to be the listening ear on the battlefield to give you that little bit of an advance warning of what was coming. Um, so there was no surprises in a way. And then we have the first rocket launcher, which you could put on the end of your uh, the end of your rifle. We have a French soldier here that's, uh, that's showing this in the picture. It would, it would go on the end of your rifle, and again, with the burst from your, your rifle through your trigger, it would eject that explosive round, and again, far into the, the enemy area. And again, it was used many times when you were in the enemy battlefields, for example, or, or trying to clear the enemy trenches. And again, it was a, a catastrophic weapon that caused a great deal of damage. And interesting to say about the tanks that before mentioned, this could also cause damage to the tanks as well, especially knocking out tracks, et cetera, or, or, or actually immobilizing a tank in the middle of the battlefield. And then again, we're going to look at some fascinating pictures here, again, with the new technology. The Germans had the, the armoured trains. And as we can see with the armoured train, first armoured train, you can see the gun at the front, the mantlet here. We've also got um, what looks quite a, <laughs> you would say, a well-together put train. Looks really professional, looks really, uh, looks like it can do the job to stop any shells. But in reality, they were not that good in a way. Many of them uh, were, were badly damaged. Many would be derailed. Um, the men inside, you can see there was not a lot of room to, to maneuver inside these trains. You can see the, the artillery guns. This is just a close look that would be in this area here. You can see the guns there, the machine guns, the artillery guns there. It's such a cramped space. And the problem with that was once this area was hit, you've got all your ammunition, your shells, it was basically like a huge bomb explosion that would go off and they'd just basically rip the, the actual train apart, derail them, and sadly the, the 
catastrophic loss of life would be unbelievable inside the trains as well. So it was a very much of a brave soldier would use the, the armoured trains, but the soldiers believed that these were good and that these were really good. So the German soldiers in these trains thought that they were well protected, where we know now that it was a very different situation. And what about the um, defence and, and almost thinking about this picture here, this is actually a tree, a tree stump or a tree trunk. And what actually I find amazing is this is actually, it's a good lookout post. The soldier would actually climb inside there. There's a hole there that he could actually fire through. So he could actually spot enemy positions, take that back to HQ and, you know, for, for any artillery attacks, for example. And it could also be used as a, a sharpshooter area as well. So the Germans would not know what's, what's happening. And also this area here where they made up the, the actual casualty of an animal where the soldier would actually climb inside the, what would look like an animal. But in fact, again, it's another trap. It's another uh, invention for protection where we can spy on the enemy and we can also use that as a covering fire as well. But the only problem with these parts are once your cover has been discovered, you're now at risk of uh, being injured seriously because if you could not get out of there in time or here and you're in the open spaces, you are basically, you're, it's, it's almost uh, like a, a shooting gallery in a way. The Germans would open fire, the machine gun fire and also artillery fire as well. So we're gonna have another look at the other technology that happened. Now the Zeppelin, Many people think that the, the London Blitz happened uh, during the Second World War, but actual fact, the first time that London was bombed from the air actually happened in the First World War. And again, it was the Kaiser's hand, it was the Germans that did this. And you can see we have a Zeppelin flying over St Paul's Cathedral. We have also a, a, a poster here again, which would have been used as a propaganda poster where we can see St Paul's Cathedral, the London skyline, including Big Ben, and the searchlights looking at the big Zeppelin bombers. Now these would come across and they would drop an incredible payload on cities and towns below. And this was a new threat. Many people in the homelands were absolutely in shock thinking, what are these huge vessels in the sky that's casting all those explosives and destroying actually in the homeland. And it was quite a worrying time for, for Britain especially and for, for across Europe, for all the soldiers fighting in the front line, that the war was actually being taken out of that area and now getting closer to their homeland. And we can see there that the Zeppelin itself, you can see the actual interior, how the Zeppelin would work. The big problem for the Zeppelin was it was uh, very highly flammable because they were run on the hydrogen gas uh, situation for the for the giving them that lift and to take them across. So this area here would actually be underneath the canopies. You can see the canopies there. And many of the, the Royal Flying Corps planes would attack the Zeppelin craft as well and bring them down. And again, it was just like an incredible fireball that would just go up because of that, that gas that was actually there to propel them to that height. And then we're going to look at the aeroplane. Again, this is another uh, fact of this was a new uh, invention. This was new. It was, it was now used on the battlefield for the front for the first time. And it's incredible to think that these men were using what would be termed as a biplane, you know, the two, as we can see here, open cockpit, um, flying into enemy territory. We'd also be reconnaissance planes taking photographs of the battlefield below to give away enemy positions, to get that uh, advantage on the battlefield, to see troop movements, to see what was happening with artillery positions, etc. So they were a very, very important part of uh, the World War I uh, battle, the airplane. And here we can see how these pilots actually kept themselves warm, believe it or not. This is an incredible invention. This is the actual pilot suit of the First World War. These cables actually heat up the pilot, believe it or not. It actually connects into his uh, flying suit. And he has his goggles here and his, his suit goes up, almost covers his face here to keep him warm as he wears the helmet as well. And it all connects to keep him warm. Because when you're flying at that height as well, the temperature does drop as we know, and it becomes very cold. And when you're in an open cockpit, as we can see there, you're exposed to all the elements. And there was many um, uh, flights and, and fights, actually, you would say dog fights during the, the First World War in the, in the actual, in the air. And here we have just some of the flying aces. 
I think the most famous one that we all know is Manfred von Richthofen, the Red Baron of Germany, who was an, an incredible uh, pilot. He uh, had many, many kills, as you would say, on in taking out enemy planes. Then we have uh, Eddie Rickenbacker there from the US, Francesco Baraccio from Italy, Eddie McManock from Britain, and then we have uh, Willie Coppens de Holt was from Belgium and Rene Paul Funk from France. Very um, notable um, fighter pilots who would who would be at really the start of, of what we now know as, as you would say, the Royal Air Force and the, what we do now. And even in the Second World, these were the, 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 the beginnings of the, air, of the air combat, the beginnings of the humble beginnings of fighter pilots. But it was an incredible time to be a fighter pilot during the First World War, as we say, to be in that open cockpit. And as we can see with Francesco there, he's got his machine gun in the front of the plane. So you had to really be a good uh, good shot in a way to bring down an enemy plane. But the most notorious and most famous one was, was this one here, the Red Baron. And again, we can see the, the planes flying through in combat and notably who also flew alongside uh, Manfred von Richthofen was actually a man who would become infamous in the Second War, and that was a man called uh, Hermann Göring. And he was, again, he got the blue max uh, because of his, uh, his, his fighter skills in the First World War. Um, but that, again, that's another story into the other war. But it just gives you that start off that, you know, there was a lot of uh, soldiers and airmen who actually did go on to fight in the Second War, who would actually become very... Uh, infamous characters, as we would know. I think it's very important, and, and I know that children love this as well, when we talk about animal heroes. Now, animals were very important in the war war effort. We had um, the horses, as we know in the film War Horse. We had the, the pigeons, who were the war birds that would take messages across the, the front lines from different areas to the HQ, etc., and the homing pigeons were very, very important. They would have a, a small vial on the leg here that a message would be rolled up and put into the leg area, and that bird would then be set free and it would fly across. The Germans actually got wind and knew about this, so they actually started to fire on these poor souls and poor animals as they would fly across the battlefields, and many of them would actually make it to their, their destination. So animals are very, very important. And there's one, of, one that's very well known, and that's uh, Cherami. A pigeon named Cherami, she was awarded the Croix de Guerre for her service during World War I. And what was incredible was that we had an encircled battalion who were almost at the point of being wiped out completely. And this incredible bird flew there and saved them, got message back to HQ to send in that assistance, and she was shot. She was shot through the eye. She was uh, covered in blood. She was had a leg hanging by a tendon. And you think to yourself that this is a pigeon. When we go to the local parks or, say, for example, ja uh, Glasgow and George Square, we see there are lots of pigeons there. And many children will think to themselves, well, this is incredible, think that these animals were heroes in the war as well. And it's incredible to, to tell their story. And here we can see Cher Amé's uh, Croix de Guerre for her bravery um, and helping that encircled uh, battalion during the First World War. And Stubby's an incredible story. I don't know if anybody knows the story of Stubby that's uh, on, on, to, on this evening. Stubby was an incredible dog. The dog that was, uh, you would say, the lost dog. It was basically a, a dog that was running um, wild in America at the time. And the soldiers there um, had their base camp set up. And the dog was going back and forth between a butcher shop and being fed and then got accustomed to the soldiers, and it would dig away underneath the perimeter fence, and away we'd go, and away into the to the camp beside the soldiers doing their basic training to the American soldiers. And so much so that they actually had to hide the dog, they had to smuggle the dog into the barracks so that they wouldn't get any trouble. And they kept on saying, we we'll have to let the dog go, but yet the dog would come back again. The dog had found its new owners, and the dog had found love with the soldiers and had that camaraderie. So the soldiers could not leave the dog behind when they were being shipped off to the front lines in Western Europe during the war. The dog went with them as well, and Stubby joined them on the battlefield. And during the, the trench warfare, Stubby would be there, Stubby would be barking to tell the soldiers there was a gas attack coming because he could sense that, he could sense where enemy positions were, and even one time actually captured a German POW. 
and he grabbed the German POW, not going to say where, but the dog grabbed him, and the German soldier was petrified. He was standing there shaking, and he was taken prisoner. And again, that was just one instance. But the one that really made Stubby so famous was the one where there was a gas attack imminent on a French town. And what happened in the French town was it could have been devastating for the inhabitants, the civilians in the town. And Stubby was running around the town, bark, 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 and making himself heard as he always was in the battlefield. And the soldiers were saying, what's, what's going on? Try and calm down. Don't, don't bark. There's so much noise. You're going to get us heard by the Germans. <laughs> and what it was, there was a gas attack and he was trying to tell everybody. So everybody was alerted and everybody was saved. And for that, the locals gave him this beautiful coat and he was given his medals and he was put these medals on his coat as a uh, proud because of he was a saviour to, to the village and he was promoted to sergeant. So he was known as Sergeant Stubby. And after the war, he went back to the States and he was no longer a lost dog that was wandering in the streets. He became adopted by the soldiers that he, he had fought with and he had been with them right up until he, he sadly passed away. But another incredible story of, of animal heroism that was in the, um, the First World War. And that's the thing that we always tell children and, and adults alike that, yes, we've got soldiers that fight in the war, but we also have animals that do play an incredible part. Although it may be in small parts and one part, it's very much integral parts, as, as Stubby and Cradiger can show us there. And we're going to look at the armistice. Obviously, we, we look at that today, the, the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month, that it was all over. And for many of the soldiers, they wondered, what was it all for? Why was all the bloodshed? What happened? Why did this happen in the first place? And for Germany, they actually you know, signed the armistice. They stopped. They surrendered. They stopped the fight. Because Germany at this point was actually on their knees. They were, they were losing money, incredible amounts of money. The country was going into such a, a poor, the economy was very, very low. So there was no way that they could keep this war going. And it was a war of attrition. It was a stalemate. There was, you know, there wasn't any movement back and forth. You had the trenches, you had the front lines. It was just a stalemate that had to come to an end. And the Germans basically thought, you know, we can't keep this, this war going. It's costing thousands upon thousands, millions even. And we think about the joy, the thanksgiving, and especially today, um, it was incredible to be in school with uh, the primary sevens. And when 11 o'clock came, the school bell rang and we observed the two minute silence. And then the school bell rang again to mark the end of the two minutes. And I will never forget the young child that stood up and said, let's applaud our heroes who sacrificed their lives for us. And the whole class just burst into a huge round of applause. And I thought that's incredible to, to see such a younger generation to have that respect and that you know to remember the heroes to remember today as it was an incredible day and we think about those that didn't come home those that still lay in the battlefields to this day where they where they had fallen those that that are buried in the in the cemeteries in france those that they, that their lives were cut short and it's very tragic and as one veteran said he said when you had as we can see here on the screen we had the the victory parade through London, it, was, it wasn't it was an incredible feeling for some because for some we had lost so much, for some we had the post-traumatic stress, and for some we found it hard to move on, we found it difficult, and we thought about those who never came back and those that were lost, that was the most important thing. And newspapers all across the land, all over the world would report it's over, and they showed the jubilation which was the great jubilation that yes, the war was now officially over and now at an end. And sad to say, as we know that there would be only a few years later that we'd be thrown into another um, terrible conflict that would again cost thousands and millions of lives changed. And here we can see nine million dead. That's the real tragedy of war. And we can see this, the, the cemeteries here, the British cemetery with all the incredible white headstones with all the names and as we said earlier every name had a story every name had a family and every age there was sad to see that so many young young boys were, were sadly
taken before their time, really. And many had actually lied to go to war just so they could do their part and be brave soldiers in the Great War. And the graves that are all around after the battlefield was just was incredible. As many soldiers would say that the worst thing about war, there is, there is no victor. There is no victory. Everybody does suffer. No one wins a war. Everybody does lose a war because of what we all go through. And at the end of the war, Germany had to then um, sign the armistice. Then we had to pay repatriations for the Allied ships that were sunk, for the, the damages during the war. And again, that, that even put Germany into the brink of, of devastation, really, with their, their economy because of this. And they were still paying for that for many, many years, just up until a good number of years ago. So artefacts, what we, we proud, proudly do with our uh, artefacts, we go around schools, as we mentioned, in care homes and charitable organisations, and we take artefacts that were used in the war um, into schools. And as you can see in the screen, we've got the, the um, British uniform that would have been worn during the, the battles of the First World War. And children get a sense of what it was like. And as many say, it's a really itchy uniform. They get a sense of just what the soldiers would wear. And as one child would say, it's incredible to know that how thin the soldiers were because the waistline's so, so small. And you look at the difference of, of how we are nowadays to, to, to what it was in the, the, the First World War. And we've also got souvenirs that were made by soldiers in the trenches, like the trench art. And they would make silk purses and um, silk bags to send back to their loved ones back home, a souvenir of France. They're, uh, they were incredible with their, uh, their work, you know, their, their, their dedication. They could create so many beautiful um, creations with their hands. We have a pair of binoculars that were used in the Great War as well, and a soldier's Bible. And every soldier would have a Bible. And this Bible, believe it or not, was actually worn in a soldier's tunic pocket here. And one of the soldiers that I had the pleasure of knowing many years ago, sadly, before he passed away, told me the story about a soldier he knew that carried his holy Bible in his tunic pocket next to his heart. And every day he would pray to God. And then one day he, he took a, a rifle shot, it was fired at him, and you wouldn't believe that the bullet actually embedded itself in his holy Bible. His holy Bible saved his life. And he became such an incredible man of God after that. After the battle, he um, went to church and he was so heavily involved. He became an elder um, and I believe he became a, a lay reader, if I recall correctly, where he, he gave services as well. And it was such an important part of his life that he really believed that, that God himself helped him on the battlefield that day. And you'd have your national identi identi identity um, papers as well, your card, um, from your soldier's pay book, where you would have your army number, the campaigns that you have fought in as well. So we'd have all that information. Again, That it's a shame that we're meeting virtually. If we were all meeting in person, we could bring these artifacts to let you have a look at them and you could hold them in your hands as well. And here we have the British War Medal that was given to the soldiers seven in the First World War. And, and it's, uh, the, this one was the, in particular was the victory medal for, for the end of the war. And again, as we said, as many veterans would say, there was no victors in the war. It was a time where we think and we, we remember those who were lost and who never came home. So it was hard to, to have that jubilation. And going on to the German side, we have the artefacts that were recovered from the battlefield. We have this uh, German canteen bottle, as you can see there. And it's actually this one, believe it or not, it's actually got a bullet hole through it. And it's quite uh, badly damaged with the bullet hole as well. We have a German uh, hand grenade, which again was recovered from one of the battlefields. And this was recovered, uh, I believe, it was the Battle of the Somme and was purchased direct from an online auction uh, a good number of years ago. And it came with the provenance with regards to it being found in the Battle of Somme in the German area. So it had been used in combat. It's been uh, not, it's not getting the active uh, gunpowder or ammunition, sorry. It's been deactivated to, to the standards of the UK government. So it's safe to take into schools and to show children and, and groups and charities, etc. And here we can see the German helmet, the type helmet that we spoke about earlier. And we've got the German tunic that you can see there as well. Very well designed tunic like the, the British tunic as well. And we have the German war medal awarded to the recipients who had also fought in the First World War. 
And German soldiers like their their British counterparts as well suffered greatly. They would have suffered with severe um, post-traumatic stress. And for many of the veterans, they would say that they remember going to the field hospitals and there was in particular, there was one part of the hospital where they were not allowed to go and they were not allowed to use mirrors in the hospital. And the reason they were not allowed to use mirrors was because without being bad in any way saying this, there was the horrific injuries that soldiers had suffered through combat. Many of them had uh, badly disfigured faces. Uh, they had, uh, it was a new way of technology again for the medical profession because they were actually finding ways in which to do in a way skin grafting, for example, to cover up bad scarring, bad wounds um, and badly disfigured their uh, faces due to, to the, the horrors of war. And for many of the soldiers, they would never be allowed to look into a mirror or even be near one because of this, because of how upsetting that this could, could send the soldier into a real um, situation of a post-traumatic stress. So very, very sad to say that a lot of the soldiers would be in convalescent homes and being very much cared for uh, amputees, etc., who had lost their legs in, in the course of the, the battles during the First World War. And I think where we are, we've got World War One quiz. So I hope that everybody's okay to do a quiz. We're going to test everybody's knowledge and I hope that you've enjoyed the, uh, the presentation this evening. I hope that we've covered um, quite in depth uh, some of the stories of the war and also some of the personal stories also. So what you can do is if you, if you would like to unmute yourself, if you would like to do that, or you can put your answers into the, the chat box, um, we will go ahead with the quiz if that's okay. Um, it's just a short quiz. I do apologise, it will not take too long. Um, so it's multiple choice. So what we're looking for is, which year did World War I begin? Was it A, 1910? Was it B, 1911? C, 1913? Or D, 1914? And so you can put that in the chat box as well. I think, oh yeah, we've got some coming in the chat box. Thank you. Oh, fantastic. Well done. So it was 1914. That was D, correct. And uh, let's go on to the next question. And who was assassinated prior to World War I? Was it A, Archduke Franz Ferdinand and his wife, B, the British Prime Minister, or C, President of the United States, or D, Lawrence of Arabia? And well done. A is the correct answer. Well done, everyone. Uh, let's, oh, sorry, I do apologise. My screen's playing funny here. Uh, I do apologise. We'll go to the next question. Who assassinated the Archduke and his wife? Was it A, Augustin Malevsky? Was it B, Josef Dubrovnik? C, Gavrilo Princip? Or D, Ivan Rom Rom <laughs> That's a funny Romatov. Of course it was. Uh, the answer was C, Gavrilo Princip. And it's interesting to note that Gavrilo Princip actually passed away while he was in jail um, with tuberculosis because at that time TB was, was not able to be cured as we do nowadays. So he actually passed away with the infection of TB at that time. Just actually prior to the end of the First World War, believe it or not. And why did America enter the war? Was it because of A, a Zeppelin bombing, B, territorial rivalry, assassination attempt on the president, or D, the sinking of the Lusitania? And well done on that, it was the sinking of the Lusitania. And Manfred von Richthofen was a flying ace for which country? And well done to everybody. That, of course, was Germany. And who was the famous lord featured on the recruitment posters? Your country needs you. Well done. That was Lord Kitchener. And did a, did a Christmas truce happen on Christmas Day 1914? Yes, absolutely. Of course, that was when we came out of the trenches and we united. We no longer were enemies and we would play football. And I don't know if anybody knows, but Germany actually beat, beat us at football that time. <laughs> they beat us that day. And I don't know if anybody knows this fact at all about a corporal, a man who would become really infamous in the Second War. Corporal Hitler was a, a dispatcher and he was in charge of a group of uh, soldiers and he was near the area of where this was happening. And the soldiers that he was with had actually had requested to Corporal Hitler, could we go out and join the fun as it were? And Corporal Hitler had turned around and said, no, we do not go out and do this with the enemy. 
we only shoot and kill the enemy. That was what he was believed to have said at that time. And that just gives us a real insight to what this man would go on to become many years later in the Second War as it evolved. And where are we now? We're going to look at during the Christmas truce, which game did the soldiers play? Was it A, cricket, B, hockey, C, football, or D, rugby? <laughs> and of course, that was football. And as I say, we, we actually got beat. Um, the Germans beat us at the soccer. And did Zeppelins bomb London during World War I? And again, well done to everybody. Yes, that's true. We were, we were bombed during World War I um, in London by the Zeppelins. And what were Zeppelins? Were they A, tanks, B, ships, C, submarines, or D, airships? Fantastic. Yeah, they were airships. And which month and year was the armistice? Was it A, October 1917, B, November 1918, C, June 1916, or D, December 1914? Of course, that was November B, November 1918. Well done. So basically, we're, we are now at the end of our, of our fun part with the question. So with the, the quiz, I hope you all enjoyed that. And I hope that you enjoyed the presentation. I hope we could cover as much as we possibly could for everyone attending this evening. And I'd like to thank everyone for coming along. And if anybody's got any questions, please, um, if you'd like to unmute yourself, and uh, you know, ask any question you'd like to ask or any questions that you'd like to talk about that we spoke about in the presentation this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sean. That was fabulous. Very, very good. Thank I you very much. Pleasure. I, don't, I don't even know where to stop. <laughs> you know, it's it's it just I mean, really, it hit me as well. Just how young these lads were. eh? Just it's such a tragedy when you think of the loss of, you know, the potential, as you say, of what could have been and uh, realizing that, you know, while it's while while people think that the end of the war was a celebration, the soldiers realized it really wasn't, as you said, you know, because they're aware of what had been lost on the battlefield. It's just incredible. It, it was it was such a war of attrition as well, where yeah. you, you just don't know if you would survive the next 24 hours and. You know, you're worried about back home and this adventure that everybody thought about that was going to be an adventure. They never thought they would meet these horrors face on. And, to, you know, when we go outside as young, when we think when you're youngsters, you go outside and you're in the pouring rain or we all do it, sadly. We complain about the rain, oh, we need to get home, it's cold, it's getting chilly, we need a bigger jacket on. But you think to yourself, what did these poor soldiers do during the war they couldn't do that they had to just stand there and you know think about being in that rain and that torrential downpour at times and so right through. I, was, yet I was saying to somebody this morning actually you know um i mean we've had lovely weather today and it's unusual but you know always on on remembrance day it's cold it's snowy it's windy it's rainy and people you know stand around the cenotaph and and you can tell in their heads they're complaining but you always think you know, the veterans that are here went through far worse than we, you know, we're, we can get back out of this in an hour. They, they couldn't. And, and I think with, with giving them that incredible name, the greatest generation really does, um, it's such an incredible title to give them. And I, and I think a lot of the veterans that we speak to in care homes, especially nowadays, will say, but we're not the greatest generation, but we'll say, but you are the greatest generation because you're, you've endured so much. You've went through what, you know, mankind shouldn't have to go through, and 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 what people actually go through is is incredible. What they what they've done, it's it's really yeah. amazing. Yeah. I was um, um I was actually looking at a, a picture um, this week of you know when war was announced in London, yeah. and and it was actually all the cheers, you know, and, and the way that it was actually perceived at the time, and there was that eagerness. You know, there was all these, and, and there was all these young guys as well who they saw it as an adventure. You know, they'd perhaps never been out of their country or even their county, and going away with their friends to this new experience, they had no idea what what they were about to 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 do and see. And you know, I mean, really, when you think of the weapons and the way that technology was advancing as well. It, it's, it's um, quite horrific. I mean, my, my uncle, my great uncle, was one of the, the aces of World War One, 
and uh -huh. yeah, and I've got details of of some of the planes that he shot down over the Western Front, and I still have this thought of one, what was it like for him looking down at the actual battlefield, and two, what was it like for the guys on the battlefield looking up at an aircraft? Yeah. Because you know, air 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 travel was in its infancy. I mean, it was only a generation before that that it had been invented. I mean, it must have been, you know, what's this? An aeroplane? I've, I've never heard of an aeroplane. You know, I've never seen one, and now all of a sudden you have them, them all over the, you know, and dropping oh. bombs on you. Never mind, just well, never, you know, as it material, yeah, as yeah. the war went on, yeah, bombs and 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 guns, machine guns, um, yeah. early on, obviously reconnaissance. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the advancement during World War One was incredible. It really was, and it's what won the war partly, you know. Um, by the time you get to 1918, um, they've learned so much. Um, these guys who were just, you know, worked in retail and worked in, you know, all these other jobs that were yeah. now learning to be soldiers had, you know, were becoming so much you know i mean they become men overnight didn't they exactly yeah, yeah. just get and there i mean be yeah. culture shock for them for sure and and learning through the experiences that, that they've yeah. had to go through yeah. it's just incredible i mean you just ugh, the thought of going through that is just unimaginable yeah. You know, you were talking in the uh, right at the beginning, uh, Sean, about um, a munitions factory. Uh, mm -hmm. My high school was a munitions factory was turned into a munitions factory during the Second World War. Huh? Oh, you know, you just that. yeah, you just and you can't. You know, you see all these kids running around and think at one point this was, you know, <laughs> pumping out death. It, it's true, and and you think yeah. about the ladies actually. You know, the girls all all stepped up and and did their part as yeah. well. They were and they were they were tooling these shells and as we said at the presentation some of the you know the equipment was bigger than they were and yet they were doing this for what they felt was the right thing to try to support their fellow soldiers who were on the front lines fighting it's yeah. it's, it's just incredible and i think with the horrors of war it's how everybody comes together yeah. no matter yes. what happens, we, all, we all unite in this common goal that is for the freedom to have the the democracy that we all need and you, you wonder if there wasn't a First World War and if there wasn't a Second World War, what would the world would be, be like? like? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wonder, really. I know. And, and I mean, I think it's when you're talking about going into the schools and the young kids standing up and clapping their hands and, and that just really touches me because I think, you know, all of us, I mean, my grandfather, you know, uncles, you know, went through that experience. So we all knew people who went through it. Those kids don't. You know, they've, oh, yeah. well, majority, they might have some who have went through more recent conflicts, but they won't have, have known a relative that went through World War One or World War Two, And, you know, it's quite, yeah, it touches me a bit. I think that there's okay. this whole thing about talk, stopping teaching World War studies in schools, which I totally disagree with. No, I think it's, you know, it's so important. They need to understand um, for sure. Um, and, and just how important it was. And then not to forget the sacrifices that were made, you know? It's it's by ignoring that that we th we're then going to repeat it. So, you yeah. know, it's important that we... That's absolutely yeah. true. So if we forget what, as we've never learned from our past, we'll never have a better future. That, that's yeah. the thing. That's what yeah. we try to let our children in school to have that concept that, you know, there shouldn't be any wars. We should all get on with one another. And as one girl turned around and said in a laugh, she said, well, we need more women to do the negotiations. I thought, you know, that's a true thing, actually. <laughs> Girl power. Good for her. Today we went outside and we, we, we took them through some basic training just to give them that concept of how cold it was and the cold day. And, you know, when we were outside, we were standing for a moment and you could hear the birds whistling. And we said that to the children that on the battlefields, you never hear that. The birds never whistle. You never hear that because it's such a a, a place of, of, of death, of horror. Or, and, and I think they get that idea where they think, oh, my goodness, it's, it's terrible what these poor, poor guys went through. Yeah. yeah. And you just think of them, you know, laying in the trenches. And as you say, it was soaking wet. And Absolutely. just... Ugh. And, and they just had to, as, as the saying goes, as one veteran said, we had to man up. We we, we couldn't complain. Uh, it yeah, was exactly. either 
we, we get on with it or we or we don't. We had to do it. We were there to do a job, and our job was to do what we were doing. Yeah. And I think that's that human spirit there is just oh, and and sad to say, I think it's it's something that we're lacking nowadays. I agree. Know, yeah. And, and I mean, I think as well, there's that whole misconception when you talk about, you know, shell shock and a lot of those guys, unfortunately, were made to feel as if, you know, they were, they were shit on their responsibilities, which a lot of the time was far from the truth. Um, mm. I, mean, I looked at a guy recently who served in the Boer War, went on to serve in World War One, actually got a gallantry medal and was going out, you know, towards the enemy line at night to try and gather information. And every night that he came back, the person oh. that was with him was shot. <gasps> and this guy came home to Scotland, you know. How did he ever recover from that? Basic, yeah, I mean, basically, well, he didn't. I mean, basically, the family were kind of saying, look, he really needs a bit of time to recuperate. You know, he's really struggling at the moment. And he was a couple of days late going back to the barracks and they sent men to get him and... He ended his life. He just could not take it anymore. And you sit there and you think, you know, there's this whole. He wasn't. He wasn't. You know, he wasn't shit on anything. He just was struggling with what he was going through, and it would have been totally different from what he was used to during the Boer War. Absolutely. You know, but yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, he's just one of the prime examples that I look at, and I think, oh God, you know, like, yeah, what a hero. Yeah, yeah, and another life wasted, right? Just because yeah. of. The way it was treated, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, he treated. had he had young children, and I think oh. there was awards made by the town to the, to these young children, and and they were they were trying to get across to them that you know your dad was a hero. But they'd rather have their daddy. Thank you. <laughs> yep. Yep. Yeah. You think of that horrible situation where soldiers were? I know it sounds terrible to say, but they were shot for being classed as cowards or deserters. But they were yeah. going through that post traumatic stress, and then the government come out not that long ago, a few years ago. And they pardoned all those who had went through that. Yeah. And I think it's almost like too little, too late. What about what these men went through? They needed that help then, not yeah. all the years later. And it, it must have been the stigma that was with the families as well, because the families must have had to endure that. But we never think about what did the families feel about that? You yeah. had lost a loved one. And then people saying, you know, that their loved one was a was a coward that didn't do the duty, they ran away or didn't, you know, strike their responsibilities, which an absolute fact, they, they, they were absolutely traumatized. Yes. Yeah. And no support for the families the way we have today either. You know, it's just, no. Lord. But then I don't even, I mean, I don't even think nowadays with recent conflicts, the services support the staff enough either. You know, a lot of the no. time it's, it's put on to the, the National Health Service and it's kind of left for them to deal with it. They should have some kind of specialized service that can follow through. Um, the well, and here it's really left to the families, you know, like they, they come together as as military families. It, it's mm -hmm. not really like you yeah. say, it needs to be it needs to yeah. be um, better organized. But, but, I mean, the, the, the problem with that with the family is that a lot of these men come back different from the men that went away. Absolutely. You know, you Absolutely. can you can you can have a, a, a husband or a father that goes away and is a very loving and friendly and jovial type character, and he comes back a broken man, and you know, totally absolutely, different absolutely. And I mean, but the only support that the families are getting are from other families. It needs to be well beyond yeah. that, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Anyway, this has well, been thank wonderful. Thank you very, thank you very much on behalf of Lanarkshire Family History Society, Sean. I've, I've also got a presentation I'd like to to make to the group as well, and okay. it's. it's from Participation for this evening, participate in the virtual presentation, the First World War story, an incredible insight into the Great War. And uh, we'll send that to you by email, Claire. And I've yep, talked to the group. And it was just to thank everybody for uh, their attendance this evening. And yep. I hope that you've all enjoyed uh, the presentation. That's and been amazing. Uh, yeah, we, we, yeah. I'm, I'm actually hoping to work with Sean on a, a World War II. Or maybe oh. even a World War One, but an Air Force because my my things Air Force work on a, a story oh, for that God. at some point. Yeah. So we're we'll probably... well, and he's going to do he's going to do a talk on the Titanic uh, for oh, us okay. as well later. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Well, there's a share in the screen so you can see the. No, oh, that's laughing. fine. Oh, yeah. <laughs> just just that's a quick wonderful. reminder for everyone: the next month's webinar takes place on the 9th of December at the same time, 7 p.m. Christine and myself. 
will actually be hosting a birthday. A, a birthday? <laughs> Where <laughs> am I getting <laughs> birthday? Sorry. A Christmas bash. <laughs> Can't believe we're at Christmas already. Sorry. Find out more about Christmas traditions in years gone by and don't forget your Christmas jumper, bring your mulled wine, your mince pies. And once we've gone through the presentation, we will stop recording and have a bit of a chit chat, see what everyone's going to be researching over the festive periods. Um, so yeah, let us know what your what your projects are at the moment. And I've put details in the chat box of how to sign up for that. If you're not already a member of Lanarkshire Family History Society, then why not join now? Annual membership ranges between £10 and £16 a year. You get three journals per year, monthly e-news and Youth of the Society's Research Centre in Motherwell. Um, you can find out more via the link in the chat box. And I don't think we've got any other questions. We had quite a, a range of... I get to the, the top of the chat? I've got loads of questions in this chat box now. But we had quite a... We had, um, I, I, the, it was fun actually watching all the answers come up on the. Yeah. Uh... <laughs> so we had people joining from Fife, um, York, Surrey in British Columbia, Toronto, Canada, mm. Toronto, Canada, Leicester, um, Kent, Arizona. Yep. So oh, we had um, quite a lot. And then there was a bit of chat going on about Crawford's as well. Christine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's, genealogy, it's genealogy after all. <laughs> so uh, yeah. In Surrey last week, actually, we did a, a primary school down in Weybridge in Surrey. Uh, we did oh. Titanic classes. That was a, a great experience. The children enjoyed their learning on Titanic. That was that was good fun. Yeah, I have I mean, to say that I think it's absolutely fabulous that you're engaging kids in all of this history uh -huh, and doing yeah. it in a way that they really understand it. So kudos to you for being able to do that. I know. I thank you. It's, it's great. The you know what we, we do with the work with the care homes, and tomorrow we're going to Erskine uh, over in Paisley, uh, Renfrewshire. Sorry, and we're going to be working with the veterans there, doing a Titanic uh, workshop, reminiscent workshop. And it's 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 great to meet so many incredible people and and children and groups such as yourself as well. Um, so if anybody's interested in any other talks that we do or any information about us, please contact us on our our website, TitanicHonorAndGlory.com. We look forward to. Um, talking to you again that would be wonderful Fabulous. that's great Thank I'll get you. something put in the, the newsletter for that as well Sean yeah yeah and I'll catch up with you soon and thank you very much for for attending tonight everyone and we'll see you all next month with our take jerseys care. bye yeah. Christmas jumpers remember <laughs> take care, take care. Bye. Thank you.